वेल फ्रेंड्स आई एम प्रोफेसर सुनील कुमार फ्रॉम स्कूल ऑफ मैनेजमेंट स्टडीज सो टुडे विल डिस्कस ऑन टेक्निक्स ऑफ प्रोजेक्ट एप्रिजल वेल फ्रेंड्स यू माइट बी अ वेल अवेयर अबाउट द कॉम्पिटिटिव एनवायरमेंट ऑफ द बिजनेस सो इन दिस कॉम्पिटिटिव एनवायरमेंट द प्रक्योरमेंट ऑफ फंड्स एंड देन एफिशियंट यूटिलाइजेशन ऑफ फंड्स इज गेनिंग अ लॉट ऑफ इम्पॉर्टेंस दीज डेज सी फ्रेंड्स फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल इन द बिजनेस यू नो वी नीड फंड्स सो फर्स्ट एंड फॉरमोस्ट इम्पॉर्टेंट आस्पेक्ट is to identify the amount of funds that is required to raise from the external sources of funds well there are two sources of funds there are two types of funds rather external funds and internal funds it means we can mobilize the funds from the external sources and as well as from internal sources so when we talk about cost of capital again we have to categorize the cost of capital in two parts fixed cost of capital and variable cost of capital so when we say fixed cost of capital it means that whatever amount of funds we have mobilized from the external sources of funds we need to pay a fixed amount as cost on account of mobilizing the funds from the external sources say for example if i say that a particular firm has mobilized rupees 10 lakh 7% debentures from the market it means the firm has to pay interest at the rate of 7% irrespective of the amount of profit or loss earned by the business the firm is bound to pay the interest at the rate of 7% to the debenture holders so it means 7% of rupees 10 lakh so it means 70000 the firm has to make the payment as interest to the debenture holder so this 70000 is the cost of capital cost of capital in order to mobilize the funds from the market so this is what we call fixed cost of capital that every year the firm has to make the payment of rupees 70000 as interest on account of borrowing the funds from the debenture holders then the second aspect is variable cost of capital or what we say the internal cost of capital so when we say variable or internal cost of capital it means the capital which the company has mobilized by issuing the equity share capital or preference share capital from the market so when the firm has mobilized say for example rupees 25 lakh by issuing the equity shares in the market that is what we call equity share capital and well friends you all might be well aware that when we mobilize the funds by issuing the equity share capital in the market the cost of capital in terms of mobilizing the funds by issuing the equity share capital will be the amount of dividend see here the payment of dividend 
on account of mobilizing the funds by issuing the equity share capital is not at all mandatory for the firm. Therefore, it is known as variable cost of capital or internal cost of capital or if the company wants to make the payment of dividend to the shareholder then company can do so. But now the question arise that whether the company can make the payment of the dividend in those year in which the company has earned loss. Well friends, see making the payment of dividend is not at all mandatory number one. Number two, even if the company wants to make the payment of dividend to the shareholder just to boost their confidence. So, the company can make the payment, but the company can make the payment of dividend only out of profits, not from the losses. Say for example, this year the company might have earned loss, but there may be a possibility that in the past years the company has earned good amount of profit and a part of the profit might have been transferred to the general reserves. So, these general reserves may be utilized for making the payment of the dividend to the shareholder even in those years in which the company has earned loss. So, this is possible, but this may take place only making payment of dividend out of the accumulated profits or what we call general reserves. So, now friends this is all what we have discussed about the procurement of funds. So, once the funds are procured by the company then we have to see how best the company can efficiently utilize the funds raised from the internal or external sources. So, now when we talk about efficient utilization and allocation of funds. So, these fund must be utilized very efficiently and the allocation of funds should also be made in a very a judicious way in order to earn the maximum return on the investment. Now again friends, there are two aspects when we speak about the allocation of funds. It means the investment of funds in the short term assets and investment of funds in the long term assets that is fixed assets. So, when we speak about investment of funds in the short term or in the current assets. So, this is what we call working capital management and the working capital management is always talked about making the functioning of the business very smoothly. It means the routine expenses, the expenses which are of routine in nature must be taken care by the working capital of a company and as far as the long term investments are concerned or what we call capital expenditure decision. So, long term investment is also known as capital expenditure decisions or it is also known as capital budgeting decisions. So, taking a decision about investment of funds in the long term or in the fixed asset is called capital budgeting decision or long term investment decision. So, well friends today we are going to discuss about the techniques of capital budgeting or techniques of long term investment decision. So, whenever we talk about long term investment decision it means capital budgeting decision 
or when we call it capital budgeting decisions, it means investment in long term assets or investment in fixed assets or investment in capital expenditures. Uh, this is how what we call it capital expenditures decisions also. These all are one and the same thing. So, my sincere advice to my students is that they should not get confused at all about these uh, you know different terms they are basically one and the same same thing. So, first is payback period this is the first technique of capital budgeting decision payback period as the name implies payback it means the initial amount that is required to invest in order to undertake a project or this is what we call cost of the project or initial investment required in order to undertake a particular project. So, now the question arises: payback periods it means in how many years the original cost of the pro, uh, project is going to recover. So, payback period is basically a period in which the total cost of the project is expected to recover. Say for example, the cost of the project is rupees 10 lakh and the expected useful life of the project is say for example, 5 years. And it is also given that the project is expected to mobilize the cash inflows of rupees 4 lakh per annum. So, here there are 3 important aspects. The first one is cost of the project. So, here cost of the project is rupees 10 lakh and the expected useful life of the project is say 5 years. It means this project is expected to generate the revenue over a period of 5 years from first to fifth year. And it is also given that this project will generate rupees 4 lakh up to fifth year 4 lakh every year up to fifth year. Now, we have been asked to calculate the payback period. So, well friends when here it is clearly mentioned that this project is expected to generate rupees 4 lakh as income every year. So, we have to recover the original cost of the project that is rupees 10 lakh. So, at the end of the second year we have generated rupees 8 lakh that is rupees 4 lakh in the first year, rupees 4 lakh in the second year. So, total we have generated rupees 8 lakh up to the end of the second year. Now, again in the third year the project will generate rupees 4 lakh. So, here we have to generate rupees 2 lakh more in order to recover the cost of the project. So, rupees 8 lakh we have already generated up to the end of the second year. Now, in the third year we require rupees 2 lakh in order to recover the entire cost of the project that is rupees 10 lakh. So, here the formula is very simple. It means when the amount of cash inflows is constant. So, here the amount of the cash inflow is rupees 4 lakh and this amount is constant over a period of 5 year that is the expected useful life of the project. So, very simple the formula is the amount required divided by annual cash inflow generated by the project. So, well friends here the amount required is rupees 2 lakh 
because 8 lakh we have already generated up to the end of the second year. Now we require rupees 2 lakh in order to recover the entire cost of the project. So, here amount required is rupees 2 lakh divided by annual cash inflows. So, annual cash inflows is rupees 4 lakh. So, 2 lakh divided by 4 lakh it means 1 by 2 it means half year. Therefore, the payback period will be 2 plus half that is 2 and half year will be the payback period of the project. It means rupees 10 lakh will be recovered from 2.5 years that is in 2 and half year we will be in a position to recover the original cost of the project. Well friends, when we say that the amount remain constant over a period of the expected useful life of the asset. So, the formula for calculating the payback period is the cost of the project divided by annual cash inflows generated by the project. Say for example, if I say the cost of the project is rupees 1 lakh and the project is expected to generate rupees 20,000 per annum. So, here the payback period will be cost of the project is rupees 1 lakh divided by annual cash inflow. So, annual cash inflow is 20,000. So, 1 lakh divided by 20,000 it means 5 years. It means the payback period will be 5 years. It means this particular project will recover the cost of the project within a span of 5 years. So, this is how we calculate the payback period. So, this is particularly possible in case where the amount of the annual cash inflow is constant. Now, the second aspect is there may be a possibility that the amount of annual cash inflow may not be constant. Say for example, if I say that the cost of the project is say for example, rupees 1 lakh and the expected useful life of the asset say for example, it is 5 years. Now, the project which we have undertaken is expected to generate rupees 25,000 in the first year, then rupees 40,000 that is 40, 40,000 in the second year, then 30,000 in the third year, then 20,000 in the fourth year and then 0 amount in the fifth year. It means in the last year the project is not generating any amount right. So, now the question arise how to calculate how to determine the payback period in case where the amount of cash inflow is not constant as you are looking that in this project the amount of the cash inflow is different over a period of time that is rupees 25,000 in the first year, 40,000 in the second year, 30,000 in the third year, 20,000 in the fourth year. Now well friends very simple the payback period must be calculated by adding the amount of annual cash inflow. It, it means we must make the accumulated balance of the annual cash inflows over the expected useful life of the asset. Now, the question arises how to make a cumulative balance. So, it is very very simple that in order to make the annual cash inflows cumulative. So, in the first year amount of rupees 25,000 will remain the same. Then in the second year the cumulative balance will be 65,000 because 
rupees 25,000 we have earned in the first year and 40,000 we have earned in the second year. So, up to the end of the second year, we have accumulated the total cash inflows 25,000 plus 40,000 that is 65,000. Now, we will keep this process continue. So, now in the third year, we have earned rupees 30,000 annual cash inflows. So, now we will add up this 30,000. So, 65,000 plus 30,000. So, total accumulated balance at the end of the third year will be 95,000 that is 65,000 plus 30,000, 95,000. Now, in the fourth year, the annual cash inflow is rupees 20,000. But friends, here you look at the informations which are available that now V requires only rupees 5000 because the cost of the project is rupees 1 lakh and up to the end of the third year we have already generated rupees 95000. So, how much V requires? V requires only 5000, but in the fourth year the project is expected to generate rupees 20,000. So, again the process will remain the same. So, now how we will calculate? Very simple, the amount required divided by the annual cash inflows. So, here amount required is 5,000 because we have already generated 95,000. Therefore, the amount required is 5000, 5000 divided by annual cash inflows. So, annual cash inflows in the fourth year is 20,000. It means 5000 divided by 20,000. It means one fourth year and one fourth years means three months. So, therefore, the payback period in this case will be three years and three months. That is what we call 3.25 years. So, this is how we calculate the payback period in case where the amount of the cash inflows are not constant. Well friends, now my sincere advice to my learners is that in case where the depreciation is also mentioned and the rate of tax is also mentioned. Then the question arises how to calculate the payback period. The entire process in this case will remain the same. Only the important aspect is that we must calculate the annual cash inflows considering the amount of depreciation and tax into consideration. Now, I very sincerely advise to my student is that when the amount of depreciation and taxation is simultaneously mentioned in the question, then the student should calculate the annual cash inflows before charging the depreciation and after considering the amount of tax. It means the expected annual cash inflows must be determined before charging the depreciation and after charging the amount of taxation. Now, the question arises that if the depreciation has already been charged the amount of taxation has already been charged. In that case, if the amount of depreciation is already charged, therefore, in order to calculate the cash inflows before charging the amount of depreciation, we should again add back the amount of depreciation in the annual cash inflows which is after charging depreciation. So, if we will add back, it means that amount of annual cash inflows will be before charging the depreciation and after charging the taxation. So, this two aspect must be remembered by the learners very judiciously and very religiously. 
we will discuss this type of practical aspect also. So, that will make the concept very much clear to my learners. Say for example, a project cost is rupees 60,000 and the expected useful life of the project is 5 years. There is no salvage value, it means at the end of the expected useful life of the asset, when we will discard the project, we will not be realizing even a single penny on account of discarding the project. Then the cash inflows before tax and depreciations are given. Say for example, the cash inflows before depreciation and tax, it is 30,000 in the first year, 24,000 in the second year, 22,000 in the third year, 20,000 in the fourth year and 14,000 that is 1 for 14,000 in the fifth year and the tax rate is given 50 percent. So, well friends, in the first row we will write the cash inflows that is 30,000 then 24,000 in the second year, then 22,000 in the third year, then 20,000 and then 14,000. So, first of all friends, we need to calculate the depreciation because here we have been provided that these annual cash inflows are before depreciation and tax. But I have already advised you that the annual cash inflows which have to be taken into considerations in order to calculate the payback period must be before depreciation and after charging the interest. So, therefore, the amount of taxation here it is not charged. So, therefore, first of all we should calculate the amount of cash inflows after charging the amount of taxation. Then we will see how to arrive at the amount of cash inflowed before depreciation and after charging the taxation. So, well friend the cost of the project is 60,000 and the expected useful life of the asset is 5 years. Very simple the amount of depreciation would be rupees 12,000 per year. It means the cost of the project divided by expected useful life of the asset. So, 60,000 divided by 5 years. So, therefore, the amount of depreciation per annum would be rupees 12,000. So, in the second row amount of depreciation would be 12,000 in the first year, then again 12,000, 12,000, 12,000 and 12,000. It means from first year to fifth year 12,000 each. Now, the third column is profit after charging the depreciation. So, the profit was rupees 30,000 in the first year and the amount of depreciation is 12,000. So, if we will subtract rupees 12,000 from 30,000, it means this 18,000 is the amount of profit or amount of cash inflows after charging the depreciation. And now, the tax rate is given it is 50 percent. So, now we have a profit of rupees 18,000 in our hand after charging the amount of depreciation. So, 18,000 ka 50 percent because the rate of ta taxation is 50 percent. So, 18,000 ka 50 percent 9,000. So, therefore, amount of taxation is 9,000. So, when we will calculate the amount of profit after tax. So, the amount of profit after depreciation was 18,000 and the amount of taxation is 9,000. 9, so, if we will subtract 9,000 from 18,000, it will arrive at rupees 9,000. So, now this 9,000 is profit after charging the depreciation and after charging the taxation. Now, 
but we have to calculate the profit before depreciation and after tax. Therefore, in order to calculate the profit before depreciation and after tax, what we will do is that we will again add back the amount of depreciation in this amount of tax. So, amount of depreciation we have already calculated is it is 12,000. So, if we will add up rupees 12,000 in this 9,000, it is 21,000. It means this 21,000 is the profit of the first year after charging the taxation, but before charging the depreciation. This is what we were required that we require an amount which was before depreciation and after tax. So, in the first year the amount before charging depreciation and after tax is 21,000. So, likewise we will calculate the same amount before profit before depreciation and after tax. So, in the second year it would be 18,000 in the third year it would be 17,000, in the fourth year it would be 16,000 and in the fifth year it would be 13,000. So, now friends if you are observing the amount of cash inflows before depreciation and after taxations, it means the amount earned by the firm over a period of 5 years is not constant. So, again we will accumulate the balance of this profit over a period of 5 years and we will calculate the payback period. So, in the first year the amount of profit before depreciation and after charging the taxation it is 21,000 it will remain the same. Then in the second year we have earned rupees 18,000. So, we will add up this 18,000 in 21,000. So, accumulated balance at the end of the second year will be 30. 9000 then the profit in the third year is rupees 17000 so we will add up rupees 17000 in 39000 so the amount will will be rupees 56000 at the end of the third year now friends the cost of the project is 60000 so therefore we require another 4000 in order to recover the entire cost of the project because the cost of the project is 60,000 and at the end of the third year we have already earned 56,000. Therefore, we require another 4,000 rupees. So, the formula is again very simple amount required divided by annual cash inflows in the next year. So, here amount required is 4,000 divided by annual cash inflows in the next year that is in the fourth year. So, in the fourth year annual cash inflows before depreciation and after taxation is 16,000. So, amount required is 4,000 divided by annual cash inflows is 60,000. So, 4,000 divided by 16,000 that is one fourth it means 3 months. So, therefore, the payback period will be 3 years and 3 months that is 3.25 years will be the payback period in this case. So, I am pretty sure that this payback period method will be very very clear in the mind of the students. They should be very uh, clear about the concept of determining the payback period. Now, the second method is net present value method. Well friends, this net present value method is basically an improvement over the payback period. As you are well aware that the payback period method suffers lot of limitations. The first and foremost limitation is that the payback period does not consider the time value of money because the expected annual cash inflows over the expected useful life of the asset. So, say for example, if the annual cash inflows in the second year is rupees 20,000. So, this amount of rupees 20,000 which the project is expected to generate at the end of the second year 
सो दी वैल्यू ऑफ रुपीज ट्वेंटी थाउजेंड आफ्टर टू ईयर एंड वैल्यू ऑफ रुपीज ट्वेंटी थाउजेंड नाउ टूडे इज नॉट एट ऑल सेम बिकॉज बिकॉज ऑफ इन्फ्लेशन बिकॉज ऑफ हाइक इन प्राइसिज द वैल्यू ऑफ द मनी गेट डेप्रिशिएटेड ओवर ए पीरियड ऑफ टाइम सो देयर फॉर दिस नेट प्रेजेंट वैल्यू मैथड टेक्स इन टू कंसिडरेशन द प्रेजेंट वैल्यू ऑफ द मनी विच द प्रोजेक्ट इज एक्सपेक्टेड टू जनरेट ओवर इट्स एक्सपेक्टेड यूजफुल लाइफ ऑफ द असेट दिस इज वाई द एन पी वी मैथड इज ऑलवेज कंसिडर्ड ए बेटर मैथड ओवर द पे बैक पीरियड वाइल डिटरमाइनिंग द वाइल यू नो कैलकुलेटिंग द वाइल इवेल्युएटिंग द प्रोजेक्ट्स वाइल टेकिंग ए डिसीजन्स वेदर टू एक्सेप्ट और वेदर टू reject a particular proposal now friends in case of payback period whether to accept the project or reject the project how to take a decision so very simple friends in case of payback period the actual payback period is compared with the predetermined payback period which is basically determined by the top management so if our payback period is less than the predetermined payback period we will go for the project it means we will accept the proposal we will accept the project and vice versa and if our payback actual payback period is equal to the predetermined payback period by the management in such a case we may accept or we may not accept the project that depends upon other internal or external factors which are again equally important while taking a decision whether to accept a proposal or not to accept the proposal as far as the net present value method is concerned this net present value method considers the present value of the money present value of the cash inflows that a project is expected to generate over its expected useful life well friends now we will take up a question and with the help of this question you will be very clear how to calculate the uh, net present value in order to take a decision whether to undertake a project or not to undertake a project the cost of the project is rupees 3 lakh and the expected useful life is 5 years the cash inflows are given 60000 in the first year again 60000 in the second year then 90000 in the third year again rupees 90000 in the fourth year and rupees 1 lakh 10000 in the fifth year so the expected cash inflows are given over its expected useful life of the asset and the discount rate is 10% it means the value of the money will get depreciated by 10% over its expected useful life well friends now the question arises how to calculate the present value of the cash inflows which are given in the question so the process is very very simple because the present value of rupee 1 at a particular discount rate will be given in the question say for example the present value of rupee 1 at 10% discount rate would be rupees 0.909 at the end of the first year and at the end of the second year it would be 0.826 at the end of the third year it would be 0.751 or at the end of the fourth year it would be 0.683 and at the end of the fifth year it would be 0.621 so these present values at a particular discount rate after first year second year third year fourth year or fifth year it means over its expected useful life these present value will be given in the question now this is one aspect that the present value of you know 
the present value of rupee 1 at a particular discount rate is probably given in the question. But we can at our own we can also calculate the present value of rupee 1 at a particular discount rate. So, the process is very very simple it means we can calculate 1 divided by 1 plus r, 1 plus r is discount rate it means 1 plus r discount rate that is 10 percent it means 0 0.10 bracket clause raised to the power 1 this is in the first year. So, it would be 0.909 then in the second year 1 divided by 1 plus r bracket clause raised to the power 2. So, it would be 0.826 then in the third year 1 divided by 1 plus r bracket clause raised to the power 3 so on and so forth. So, we can easily calculate the present value of rupee 1 at a particular discount rate up to the expected useful life of the asset. So, in this case now we can calculate the net present value. So, the annual cash inflows in the first year is rupees 60,000. So, if you multiply rupees 60,000 by present value that is 0 0.909 in the first year it will come rupees 54,540. This is the present value of the cash inflows in the first year. Now, again the process will remain the same over its expected useful life. So, second year again the expected useful uh, the expected annual cash inflow is again 60,000 multiply by present value of rupee 1 that is 0.826 at the end of the second year. If you multiply it that will come 49,560 so on and so forth. So, the total present value of expected cash inflows over its expected useful life is rupees 3,1470. This is the total present value of all the cash inflows over its expected useful life minus cost of the project. So, total present value of all the cash inflows minus cost of the project. So, cost of the project is rupees 3 lakh. So, if you subtract rupees 3 lakh from rupees 3 lakh 1470 you will arrive at 1470. So, this is the net present value. So, well friends now the acceptance and rejection criteria is again very very simple. If the NPV that is net present value is greater than 1. Say for example, say if the net present value is positive, it means the present value of all the cash inflows is more than the present value of cash outflow. So, present value of cash outflow is again it will remain the same that is rupees 3 lakh the cost of the project. So, if the NPV is positive project would be accepted and if the NPV is negative project would be rejected and if NPV is equal to uh, sorry if NPV is equal to 0 it means neither it is positive nor it is negative. So, the project may be accepted and may not be accepted depending upon the other internal and external factors which are equally important. So, that depends upon the top management that in such a case what other important factors which are considered necessary for taking a decisions must be taken into account and accordingly the decision can be taken. So, this is the uh, second techniques that is net present value method. So, well friends the advantages as I have already discussed with you the first one is time value of money. So, this method considers the time value of money. Then the second advantages of this method is full life of the project. So, this technique of capital budgeting considers the entire life of the project as you might have seen in case of payback period. Payback period does not consider the entire life of the project. So, in payback period we are bother only up to a stage where 
we are in a position to recover the entire cost of the project. So once the entire cost of the project is recovered, then we have nothing to do with the uh, remaining cash inflows which a project is generated to uh, generated in the future period. But this NPV method is not like this. This NPV method considers all the cash inflows uh, over its expected useful life of the asset. So again this is a big advantage. Then the third one is wealth maximization. Well friends, when we speak about wealth maximization, so basically it is a long term objective of the organization and long term objectives are achieved only in a case when we consider the entire uh, life of the project because we should not consider a project only up to a stage where we are in a position to recover the cost of the project because sometimes what happens that practically what happens maybe in the initial years when we are not accumulate ties and when we are not very much uh, familiar about the business environment there may be possibility that we may earn less but over uh, its expected useful life but with the passage of the times we may get expertise we are experienced one and maybe because of the advancement of technology and maybe because of the experienced personnel working in our organizations we may turn the losses into profits so therefore we can achieve the wealth maximization objectives only in the long run and this npv method considers the project profitability in the long run so we must be well prepared about the acceptance and rejection decision in the long run not in the short run. Then the disadvantage so again this method suffers lot of disadvantages the first one is difficult to determine the discount rate. So well friends again it is almost next to impossible to determine a suitable discount rate that at what rate we have to discount the cash inflows. So this discount rate is basically determined by the top management. It is the top management decision and it is basically a hypothetical decisions. So it is not based on the facts and when any decision is taken hypothetically, so that decision is just like that it will lead us nowhere because it is not uh, a practical phenomena. It is simply a rate which is hypothetically determined by the top management. Then second one is in case of project having different cost may not give desired result. So this NPV method does not hold true when the cost of the project is different. Say for example, there are two projects, project A and project B. The cost of project A is rupees 10 lakh and the cost of project B is rupees 1 lakh. So well friends, the present value of cash inflows are given. The present value of cash inflows of project A is rupees 15 lakh and project B is rupees 3 lakh. Now we calculate the NPV. So NPV, how, how do we calculate NPV? present value of cash inflows minus present value of cash outflow. So present value of cash inflows in first project that is project A is 15 lakh minus present value of cash outflow that is rupees 10 lakh. So therefore the NPV is rupees 5 lakh in case of project A and in case of project B NPV would be rupees 2 lakh. It means present value of cash inflows are rupees 3 lakh minus present value of cash outflow that is rupees 1 lakh. So 3 lakh minus 1 lakh 2 lakh. So as per the NPV method project A is profitable and project A must be accepted. But this is not the real scenario as you see that NPV method does not consider the cost of the project and it does not consider the return in relation to the investment and until or unless the returns are compared in relation to the investment, uh, we cannot take a good decision. So therefore, the returns must be analyzed and must be uh, compared in relation with the cost of the project. 
So, here rupees 5 lakh is the uh, NPV. So, this 5 lakh must be compared with the cost of the project. So, that is rupees 10 lakh. So, it means this project is generating the revenue at the rate of 50 percent. But in case of project B, the cost of the project is rupees 1 lakh and the NPV is rupees 2 lakh. So, here this project is generating the revenue at the rate of 200 percent. So, therefore, this is the major drawback of this NPV method that this NPV method does not give a good result in case where the cost of the projects are different. So, in case if the cost of the all the projects are same, then it does not uh, you know uh, matter much. But when the cost of the projects are different, then definitely it matters a lot because the returns must be analyzed, the returns must be compared in relation to the investment and then we must see which project is giving the maximum return. So, a project giving maximum returns must be accepted. So, well friends this is how we take a decision under NPV method that if NPV is positive we accept the proposal, it is negative we reject the proposal. And if NPV is 0, we may accept and we may reject the proposal. Well friends, if it is also given in the questions that in case of more than one project, then how to take a decision as far as the NPV method is concerned. So, it is very simple that in case of more than one project, any project giving the highest NPV must be accepted and must be given a rank 1 and then accordingly we may give the rank to the other projects. The projects which are at number 2 must be given rank 2. The project who is generating the NPV uh, at number 3 must be given rank 3 so on and so forth. So, this was all about the techniques of capital budgeting decisions. So, these are the two techniques. There are other techniques of capital budgeting. So, we expect that the remaining techniques of capital budgeting we will also discuss in the time to come. So, with this I extend my sincere thanks to my learners, to the organizers who have viewed my program, who have listened to this program very carefully, very patiently and I am pretty sure that the learners who have paid uh, their kind attentions, who have been very attend uh, attentive throughout the session, they might have definitely been benefited. So, with this I again extend my best wishes to my learners. Thank you, thank you very much.